Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my full review of the Canon RF 16mm f2.8, an affordable ultra wide angle prime lens for Canon's EOS R full frame mirrorless system. And in this video, I'll show you what it can do. Announced in September 2021 alongside the RF 100-400mm, the RF 16mm f2.8 costs around $299 or £319, making it not just the widest prime lens in the RF system to date, but also one of the smallest and cheapest too. Note that it isn't compatible with EOS DSLRs or EOS M cameras only the EOS R system, and it's aimed at people who are into landscape, architecture, astrophotography and vlogging. Until now, ultra-wide coverage in the native RF mount has been left to large, heavy and expensive L-series zooms, such as the original RF 15-35 2.8L on the right, costing a hefty $2,400 and weighing 840 grams. Canon later released the RF 14-35 F4L, zooming 1mm wider and sacrificing one stop of aperture to become smaller and lighter at 540 grams and cheaper too at $1700, but that's still a significant chunk of change. So the new RF 16mm 2.8 on the left is clearly a completely different proposition. At just 69 by 40 mil and 165 grams, it's a fraction of the size, weight and price of the L zooms, and it brings ultra-wide goodness to a broader audience. In fact, I'll say it right now, despite some inevitable shortcomings, the RF 16 2.8 is a no-brainer for any EOS R owner. But you don't get anything for free in the world of optical design, and as you'll discover later in my review, the RF 16 2.8 achieves many of its goals with substantial help from digital corrections. These are applied automatically by EOS cameras for videos and JPEGs, or using lens profiles on RAW files. But the end result is arguably what counts, so to help you decide if this is the right lens for you, I've tested the RF 16 2.8 for distant landscape sharpness against those L zooms as well. Close-ups with potential for background blur, diffraction sun stars, handheld vlogging on bodies with and without IBIS, and even some astrophotography too. Yep, I stayed up way past my bedtime to show you how it performs on the night sky. So if you enjoy my approach to testing, do make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on any of my upcoming reviews. I've got loads of RF lens reviews on their way. Okay, let's get on with it. In terms of physical design, the RF 16 2.8 shares a lot in common with the RF 51.8, including the same 43mm filter thread. Yep, that's a slightly unusual size, but there are some NDs available if you search them out. And both lenses have no optical stabilisation and no weather sealing either. In fact, place them side by side and you'll see they also share essentially the same barrel and controls. So that means just one ring on the barrel with a single switch to set it between custom control and focusing. Now in theory I have no problem with this shared use on a compact budget lens, especially if there's no room for a separate RF control ring, but annoyingly like the RF 51.8, Canon continues to force you to also select manual focus in the menus, or assign it to a function button, if you want to use the ring to manually focus. Surely simply setting the switch on the lens from control to focus indicates that you want to use the ring to focus, but no, you'll need a more expensive lens with a dedicated AF-MF switch for that convenience. I really hope this has changed with a firmware update, as a growing number of budget RF lenses employ this simplified control strategy. Also notice how the internal barrel extends a little during power up as well as during focusing. Now it won't block a filter, but again it means you should be careful in dusty or wet conditions. But first, for focusing speed in single autofocus with a central area on an EOS R5 and the closest bottle near to the minimum focusing distance. Now, like other budget lenses on the Canon system, it's not exactly the fastest focuser, but it does so smoothly and the speed shouldn't impact most of the situations where you'll use it. Now the focusing motor can be audible in very quiet surroundings, so I'll demonstrate that later on. Now for the optical quality starting with coverage, so here's my standard distance scene of Brighton Pier with the RF 16 2.8 angled so that details run right into the corners. This is from the EOS R5 with the in-camera corrections applied automatically. Now I don't know about you, but I prefer evaluating the sharpness of lenses for landscapes on actual landscapes at long distances. Now it's hard when you need to repeat the test for multiple lenses, not to mention needing consistent weather in order to make these fresh comparisons, but I think it's worth the effort. Let me know if you do too. So how much wider are the L zooms? Here's the RF 15-35 2.8L at 15mm, where it's definitely capturing a broader field of view than the 16, and to illustrate that, I've superimposed a red frame where the outer edge represents the coverage from the 16mm prime. 
And now for the RF 14 to 35 F4L at 14 mil, where it's capturing a fractionally broader field of view than the 15 to 35, but there's barely anything in it. For comparison, I've indicated the widest coverage of the 15 to 35 with the outer edge of the green frame, and again the coverage of the 16 with the outer edge of the red frame. Both of the zooms are clearly wider than the 16mm Prime, but I wouldn't say there's much to choose between the two zooms in terms of wide coverage. Ok, now back to the RF16, wide open at f2.8, and all the test images I'm going to show you were taken on the EOS R5 with lens corrections automatically applied, so this is out of camera quality. Taking a closer look in the middle shows a decent amount of detail from the high-res R5, with only small improvements in contrast if you can stop down. Head out to the far corner and as you'd expect for a lower price lens, the image gradually becomes a little softer when the aperture is wide open and there's evidence of some soft fringing in the corners too, but on the whole it's not too bad. Stop down to f4 and both aspects improve, while at f5.6 the little 16 is beginning to look pretty good across the frame. So for landscape images, unless you really need the aperture wide open, I'd recommend closing it to say f5.6 or f8 for the best results into the corners. Let's return to the centre of the image with the 16mm at 2.8 on the left and the RF 14-35 to F4L on the right at F4 and adjusted to match the field of view, where coincidentally the EXIF data reported it as being at the same 16mm focal length, so that's quite reassuring. Judging from these magnified crops, their quality in the middle of the frame at their maximum apertures is actually pretty similar, and this is with the 16mm operating one stop brighter too. Closing the 16mm's aperture to f4 to match the zoom on the right doesn't make a significant difference, but when both lenses are close to f5.6, I'd say the 14-35 to is looking a little crisper, if you have a high-res body like the R5, in order to get the most out of it. Moving on to the corner crops from both lenses, back at their maximum apertures, actually shows a surprisingly similar result, when I'd expected the 14-35 to to actually perform better. In fact, if you pixel peep, the 16 maybe looks a tad better resolved on the finest details. Now here's the 16 switched to f4 to match the zoom, and finally for them both at f5.6, where I'd say the 16 continues to enjoy a minor lead. Note that this test was made with a central focusing point in order to evaluate the overall field flatness, and you may enjoy sharper corners if you focus in the corner. Ok, now back to the middle crop from the 16 on the left, but this time with the 15 to 35 2.8L on the right, both at f2.8 and with the zoom adjusted to match the field of view. Here I'd say they're again delivering similar detail, although the 15 to 35 is arguably a tad crisper and showing a little extra contrast here. Close them both to f4 and there's minor improvements to contrast and sharpness, but again the 15 to 35 stays slightly ahead, and the same applies again when both lenses are close to f5.6. Comparing the corner sharpness of both lenses wide open at 2.8 though shows a clear lead from the 15 to 35 on the right, which has maintained its performance from the middle, leaving the little 16 looking quite soft in comparison. As you saw before, the 16 can improve a little in the corners at f4 and again at f5.6, but the 15 to 35 remains ahead throughout, while also delivering sharper corners or at least a flatter field than the 14 to 35. But then it is also the biggest, heaviest, and by far the most expensive of the three. Funny that. Ultra wide angle lenses are also great fun after dark. Here's a 6 second exposure I took with the 16mm, closed one stop to f4 while balanced on a railing. Who needs a tripod for long exposures, right? Zooming in on the skyline of London across the Thames shows some nice crisp details and even some diffraction spikes on the lights shining directly into the lens. I'll talk more about them in just a moment. Astrophotography is another key subject for ultra wide lenses, and here the broad coverage has allowed me to easily grab a nice landscape element to the South Downs facing north in this 5 second exposure, taken with the EOS R6 at 1600 ISO and with the lens wide open at f2.8. The big question though is how those stars look, especially close to the edges of the frame when the aperture is wide open. Now, a young moon, not to mention light pollution in Brighton, may have illuminated the sky in this shot, but zooming in does reveal some stars, and taking a closer look in the middle of the image shows their points of light, as you'd hope. As you move towards the corners, they remain fairly well behaved until you reach the extremes when some coma becomes visible. Closing the aperture one stop to f4 reduces the coma, while also sharpening up the edges of the landscape elements in this shot, and I'd recommend it if you can accommodate the reduction in light. That said, if you're not examining the far corners, the Astro performance isn't that bad at f2.8 considering the price of the lens. Ok, now for portraits, a subject you may not have considered for an ultra-wide lens, but the broad field of view makes it easy to capture someone's surroundings even from close range or in tight interiors. 
Like all ultra wides, you'll need to be very careful with distortion if the subject gets too close or away from the middle, unless of course that's the effect you're after. It's also a perfect focal length for vlogging or presenting pieces to camera as I'll show you in just a moment. But first, a look at the potential for blurred backgrounds at close range. I took this shot as close as the lens would focus to the star at the top of the ornament, that's about 13cm away, and despite the inherently broad depth of field of an ultra wide lens, you'll see it is possible for some blurring in the background. You'll just need to get really close to your subject to maximise it. And for comparison, here's the effect when closed one stop to f4, then to f5.6, and finally to f8. At the other end of the aperture range, you can achieve attractive diffraction spikes, with the 7 aperture blaze delivering 14 spikes. This is how it looks with the aperture fully closed to f22, and now one stop wider at f16, and next to f11, where the effect becomes reduced, but not unpleasant. Okay, now for video performance, starting with a focus pulling test between the two bottles, with the nearest one being very close to the minimum focusing distance. You can see here the R5 and 16mm smoothly refocusing between the bottles when the central AF target falls on them. It may not be particularly fast in this test, but again, it's very smooth and confident. This also applies with face detection enabled, although again, be careful how close you get to the lens to avoid distortion, unless again, that's what you're after. Meanwhile, the STM focusing motor, like the 51.8, is faintly audible in operation, so to find out if that's going to be an issue for video, here's two tests using the built-in microphones, this time on the EOS R6, starting with a focus pull between a tape measure and me in the background. So listen closely and tell me if you can hear anything, and more importantly, whether that's going to be an issue for you. And now for a version while I'm talking to the camera. So as I have a chat with you, I'm gonna hold up this tape measure in front of the camera and let the lens refocus on it. And then back to me again and back and forth. And as I talk, I want you to listen out for those focusing motors and try and hear if, uh, well, see if you can hear them. And this is using the built-in microphones on the Canon EOS R6. So obviously this is a worst case scenario because those are the microphones which are closest to the lens itself. So do you think this is an issue or not? Let me know. Okay, now I've come outside for all the people who prefer to record in this kind of environment with a bit of ambient noise around them. So again, the question remains, can you hear the RF 16 millimeters focusing motors as I bring an object close to the camera and away again? And this is of course a perfect opportunity <laughs> to advertise some Camera Labs merchandise. Have you seen this lovely official Camera Labs mug? It could be yours. Links in the description. This is surely the best way to do advertising, isn't it? By incorporating it actually into one of your tests. So while you will hear the focusing motor if you're using the built-in microphones in a silent room, it becomes much less of an issue when you're talking at the same time or if you're in a noisier environment. If it does bother you though, just use a lav mic or play some sound over any focusing, like recording a separate voiceover like I'm doing here. Next for a focus breathing test with the 16mm focusing from infinity to the closest distance and back again where you'll see there's quite a noticeable change in magnification. So if you're performing significant focus pulls at this may be off-putting, but you've already seen a bunch of examples prior to this test, so tell me if it's going to be an issue for your videos. I did, however, find the breathing an issue when manually focusing the lens in a magnified view, such as checking focus on the astro photos earlier. As I turned the focusing ring in the magnified view, the stars would visibly move across the screen or viewfinder as they went in and out of focus, and that made it more of a challenge to nail the ideal position. So do bear that in mind if that's how you're going to be using this lens. And finally, for handheld vlogging, one of the most popular video applications for a lens like this. So let's start with the RF16 at 2.8 on an EOS R5 filming in 4K with sensor stabilization or IBIS disabled. So this is a completely unstabilized clip as the lens doesn't have optical image stabilization. Next here it is with IBIS sensor shift stabilization enabled on the R5. Now depending on how much you turn or shake, ultra wide lenses on bodies with IBIS can often cause undesirable wobbling at the edges, but by walking in a straight line I've mostly avoided them here. In this third clip I've enabled the R5's digital movie stabilization, which is applied on top of existing sensor shift IBIS, they're working together here. I'd say here it's a little smoother than IBIS alone, but with occasional stutters. Note that the shutter speed was a 50th of a second throughout these tests, so that's not going to be an issue. 
And finally, with the R5's enhanced movie stabilization, again applied on top of existing IBIS. Now this time you're paying for greater stabilization with a tighter crop, making the 16 feel more like a 24mm, at least when held at arm's length. So the stabilization looks good, but I'd prefer to use this on some kind of handle because it's too close here. And here's the three stabilized clips side by side with IBIS alone on the left, IBIS with digital stabilization in the middle, and IBIS with enhanced digital stabilization on the right. Which one do you like best? But not everyone has a Canon camera with IBIS, so I asked Ben to make some similar tests with his own EOS R body, which as you may recall, does not have sensor shift stabilization. So here he is filming with no stabilization from the camera or the lens, and this is filmed in 1080 for uncropped coverage on the EOS R. The camera is held on the end of a switch pod stand, which you can see reflected in his sunglasses. Next, here's the EOS R with digital movie stabilization alone. Remember, the camera doesn't have sensor shift IBIS and the lens doesn't have optical IS either. So this is basic digital compensation alone. And I'd say it's looking pretty good. Now, all of Ben's clips are also filmed at f2.8 and a 50th of a second. And now for the EOS R with enhanced movie stabilization. Again, a purely digital solution here. And as you saw on my earlier clips, there's a significant crop. As for the result here, at times it can look very smooth, but there's also an undesirable judder as Ben walks. Your mileage will of course vary. And here's those three clips side by side with no stabilization at all on the left, basic digital stabilization in the middle, and the enhanced movie stabilization on the right. Let me know which one you like best, and more importantly, whether you think digital stabilization alone is enough to make a lens like this work for handheld vlogging. Oh, and in case you were wondering, here's how the EOS R looks with the 16mm when filming in 4K, where that camera sadly applies a hefty crop. And first, you're seeing it without any stabilization. Next, with basic digital movie stabilization. And finally, with enhanced movie stabilization, which incurs a further crop, rendering it way too tight for this lens. Thanks, Ben. And if you'd like to see more of his videos, do check out his channel, which is called Ben Harvey Photography. Okay, before wrapping up my review, I wanted to provide more detail on the thorny subject of lens corrections. Like many compact and affordable lenses today, the RF 16 2.8 makes substantial use of digital corrections, in particular to compensate for significant barrel distortion. Now, if you shoot video or JPEGs in camera, you won't actually notice anything as the corrections take place automatically behind the scenes and you're just left with a normal looking image. And if you shoot in RAW, applying the lens profile in your software will have the same effect, but it also gives you a chance to turn it off to see what's happening behind the scenes. Plus, at the time I made this review, the lens profile wasn't yet available in Adobe Camera RAW, so all my RAW files started off uncorrected. So here's a boring photo of an old brick wall, and it's a JPEG out of camera, so those corrections have already been automatically applied. Now, while the cement clearly needs some work, it's mostly square with straight parallel lines but now compare it with a raw version where the lens profile hasn't yet been applied and the difference is dramatic to say the least. This is what the lens optics are actually presenting to the sensor before digital correction. And now switching back to the corrected JPEG version, you can see the profile has significantly stretched the image back into shape with an inevitable crop as a result. Here's another example of a shed door looking fairly normal in the corrected JPEG, but now in the raw version with lens compensation disabled, where again the barrel distortion is significant. And now back again to the JPEG for comparison. And now for another example, but this time at the closest focusing distance starting with the in-camera JPEG, before switching to the uncorrected raw version, where you'll also notice significant vignetting in the corners. And now back to the JPEG again. Now this was taken at f2.8, so in case you think it's vignetting due to the aperture, let's switch it for a version at f8, starting with the corrected JPEG, and now for the uncorrected raw version where the vignetting remains. So this is in fact the edge of the actual imaging circle, which becomes more obvious as the view shrinks due to the focus breathing at close range that I showed you earlier. But switch back to the JPEG again, and everything looks fine. Now, if this is your first time glimpsing behind the curtain, you may be somewhat alarmed by what's going on behind the scenes. But again, it's not uncommon for compact and affordable lenses to rely on compensation, especially modern lenses. Lens designers have a goal in mind and today can achieve it with traditional optics alone or a combination of optics and digital correction. If you want a pure optical solution, there are many well-corrected alternatives, such as the two L ultra-wide zooms that I've showed you earlier, and I've no doubt that some L series wide primes for the RS system will come soon, but these are all larger, heavier, and more expensive. 
If you want a compact and affordable ultra-wide lens like the RF16 2.8, it's going to employ digital corrections, and you have to ask yourself if the end result satisfies your needs. And if you need further reassurance, the field of view after the compensation has been applied remains 16mm, so it's not like Canon is cheating you out of ultra-wide coverage, it's just starting with a much wider image and then wrangling it back into shape. And with all that said, it's time for my final verdict, during which I'll show you a bunch of photos I took with the RF16 2.8 on the EOS R5 and R6. As always, you can access the originals via my review of the lens at cameralabs.com. The Canon RF16 mm 2.8 is that rarest of things, an exotic lens at an accessible price. The ultra-wide coverage delivers photos and videos packed with drama, but from a compact, light and affordable lens that won't break the bank or your back. It is, in short, enormous fun and a no-brainer for almost any EOS R owner. Of course, you don't get anything for free in the world of optics, and the RF16 not only suffers from visible focus breathing, but relies on substantial digital corrections. If you shoot video or JPEGs, though, these are applied automatically in camera, so you may not even notice anything's going on, while RAW shooters can apply lens profiles during processing to perform the same task. As such, it may actually be a non-issue, but optical purists should be aware that significant wrangling is taking place behind the scenes, especially to geometry. Meanwhile, the absence of optical stabilisation may also seem like a downfall for a lens partly aimed at vloggers, but in my test the footage could be effectively stabilised by cameras with IBIS, or even just with digital compensation. Now, if you do want optical stabilisation, less breathing and lower distortion, Canon's 14-35 f4L and 15-35 f2.8L will give you all of that along with the flexibility of zooming to 35mm, weather sealing and in the case of the 15-35, sharper corners too. But both those lenses are larger, heavier and considerably more expensive. So while I loved the performance of the 15-35 2.8, it's five times heavier and six times the price of the RF16 while sharing the same maximum aperture. Ultimately, you're not going to get optical perfection from a $299 lens, but the results from the RF16 remain sufficiently compelling that almost all EOS R owners will want one, even if they already have one of the L zooms. I also appreciate Canon developing both high-end aspirational and lower-end affordable lenses for the RF system to suit a broader range of buyers. Indeed, it's this kind of lens that will draw new owners to the EOS R system, and it's just going to sell like hotcakes. It is very easy to highly recommend. And that marks the end of another lens review, and as always, if you found it useful, please do consider subscribing to support my channel and ensure you don't miss out on any of my future reviews. I've got lots more RF lens tests on their way. There's also links in the description to check the latest pricing or to treat me to a coffee or yourself to some Camera Labs merchandise like one of those mugs you saw earlier or my in-camera photography book. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think of the lens in the comments and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.